Welcome to City Hall, and good morning to all of you. We'll call the meeting to order, and with us today is Reverend Ben Staley of Chapel Hill United Methodist Church to provide our invocation. Following that invocation, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance, and we please ask you all to join us for both. Reverend Staley. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the freedom we have to come to get together this way and do the business of the city. We're thankful for these good council members and our new mayor, and we pray your guidance for them, that they will have uh, wisdom as well as uh, strength of character and courage for leading this city. We pray for homes and families in these days of uh, so many tests and trials, and we pray for those in our schools, our teachers and students especially, as we come to the close of a school year. Help them to finish strong, and we're praying for wisdom as uh, they make changes in the district, especially students and families who are changing because of closed schools. Guide in that whole process. We're thankful for uh, the fact that we can have safety here in this city, we pray that you'd continue to watch over us, keep us free from violence, especially as we come up on Riverfest and start baseball. We ask that you would uh, be with our police officers and all of our uh, responders, that you'll keep them safe and well. Bless our businesses, that they will remain wise and good stewards of the resources we have. We're thankful for the peace that you give us individually the peace that's in our city and our nation, and the hope that is ours as we care for one another with the heart and mind of Christ in whose name we pray, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Staley. And thank you to all of you once again for attending our city council meeting. I am really grateful to see all of, uh, many of our seats here filled. Um, I do wanna address something really quickly. Um, we post our agenda every Thursday evening um, in two different places on our website. And they were posted on our website on Thursday, unfortunately, one of those locations did not show up properly. So it was reposted yesterday morning, um, again, 24 hours before this meeting. Um, but once again, that agenda was posted on Thursday um, and staff uh, has shared with me that, um, again, moving forward in both locations, it will, they will make sure that it does show up on Thursday evening. Thank you. Um, to let folks know where you can find those agendas, again, uh, you just go to our wichita.gov website, click on City Council, and right there on that front page, there should be um, the link to agendas, minutes, and presentations. You just click on that, and that's where you can see all of these agendas. Madam Clerk, please call the first item. Approve the minutes of the regular meeting of April 2nd, 2024. Do we have any corrections to the minutes? I see none. I move that we approve those minutes. Motion and a second. Any other discussion? I see none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Awards and proclamations, proclamations, Fair Housing Month. May I please ask the Realtors of South Central Kansas to join me at the front.
Thank you to the realtors of South Central Kansas. This proclamation reads, whereas the Fair Housing Act enacted on April 11, 1968, enshrined into federal law the goal of eliminating racial segregation and ending housing discrimination in the United States, and whereas the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, and disability, and commits recipients of federal funding to affirmatively further fair housing in their communities, the City of Wichita prohibits discrimination because of the non-discrimination ordinance enacted on October 29, 2021, and whereas our social fabric, the economy, health, and environment are strengthened through diverse, inclusive communities, acts of housing discrimination and barriers to equal housing opportunity are unacceptable to a common sense of decency and fairness. And whereas fair housing is integral to the ethical commitment of members of the National Association of Realtors and the Realtors of South Central Kansas, and is critical to the ability of all real estate professionals to serve their clients, customers, and communities. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Lily Wu, Mayor of the City of Wichita, along the, with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 2024 Fair Housing Month in the City of Wichita and encourage all citizens to promote appropriate activities by private and public entities intended to provide or advocate for equal housing opportunities for all residents and prospective residents in Wichita, Kansas. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. We're happy to join you today. As members of your local association of realtors, we are proud to receive this proclamation on behalf of the city. In 2015, the individual associations of Ark City, Butler County, Newton, Winfield, and Wichita merged to form the Realtors of South Central Kansas. Several years ago, we celebrated our 100th anniversary as the voice for real estate in South Central Kansas. This voice is a proponent of fair housing, an advocate for home ownership, and a champion for high quality of life. We recognize the significance of the Fair Housing Act and confirm our commitment to upholding fair housing law, as well as a commitment to offering equal professional service to all in their search for a home. We applaud the city for its passage of the non-discrimination ordinance in 2021, a further affirmation that fair housing is a priority for Wichita. For realtors, fair housing is more than a list of do's and don'ts, rights and penalties, and continuing education. As stewards of the American dream, we depend on a market that embraces equal opportunity. Fair housing protects our livelihood and our businesses. Discrimination in the real estate industry is real and ongoing. We, as community leaders, have the opportunity to be a part of a transformative solution, providing equal service to all. April is Fair Housing Month and a great time to affirm as a city that we are helping to build thriving, inclusive communities. Fair housing impacts all citizens, all markets, and all neighborhoods. Thank you, and we hope that you will celebrate fair housing with us for the rest of April. May I please ask Shabad Lubachem of Wichita to please come forward? This proclamation reads, whereas the basis for the community of any society is education, and in the great city of Wichita, Kansas, the education of our youth is a priority in order to achieve its highest goals, education must not only impact knowledge, but also teach students how to live, 
forming and strengthening their moral character to make a better life for themselves as individuals and for society as a whole. And whereas a global spiritual leader, the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem M. Shisnerson of Righteous Memory, stressed that a moral and ethical education empowers every individual to develop their full potential in making the world a better place. And whereas such an education can nurture the unity of diverse people through encouraging increased acts of goodness and kindness with awareness that even a single positive act of an individual can change the world and usher in an era of global peace. And whereas Education and Sharing Day is observed each year on Rebbe's birthday in recognition of his outstanding and lasting contributions towards the improvement of education, morality, and acts of charity around the world, a day to pause and reflect on our responsibility to ensure our youth have the foundation necessary to lead lives rich in purpose and fulfillment through service and good works. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Lily Wu, mayor of the city of Wichita, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 19th, 2024, as Education and Sharing Day in the city of Wichita, and encourage all citizens to work together to create a better, brighter, and more promising future for all. Thank you, Mayor Lily Wu, and all the members of the City Council for this tremendous honor. With this proclamation, Wichita proudly joins the President, governors in dozens of states, and hundreds of other cities and townships in designating the Rebbe's birthday, which is always celebrated four days before Passover as Education and Sharing Day, in tribute to his outstanding dedication to education. The Rebbe taught that education, in general, should not be limited to the acquisition of knowledge and preparation for a career. Instead, the educational system must pay more attention, indeed the main attention, to the building of character with emphasis on moral and ethical values. The Rebbe emphasized that every individual, and in fact, every individual action, has an impact on the entire universe and instilled the hope for a brighter future into the lives of countless people across the globe. Since 1978, the U.S. Congress has designated Education and Sharing Day on the Rebbe's birthday as a time to pause and recognize our responsibility to ensure that our young people have the foundations necessary to lead lives rich in purpose and fulfillment. Education and Sharing Day is about creating conversations. It's about the conversations we have with our children around the dinner table, the conversations we have with our students in the classrooms, and the conversations we have day in and day out that can have an impact on the hearts and minds of our young ones. The Rebbe taught that in truth, every person is an educator, and we must be mindful of our ability to impact the lives of others. People are more influenced by the things they do than by the knowledge they are taught. Therefore, beyond the conversation, it is important to promote these ideas through action. In 1974, the Rebbe introduced the charity campaign. This was not a fundraiser for a specific cause, or a call to philanthropists to write out big checks. Instead, it was a grassroots campaign to train us all to become givers. The idea is simple. Set aside a box in your home or in your office as a charity box and start off the day with giving a small amount to charity. Children should have their own charity boxes and should be encouraged to give charity every day. This will educate them to have empathy and to care for others. The catch is to do this on a consistent basis. Beyond the value of the accumulated charity, money benefiting worthy causes, the hand becomes a giving hand and one becomes a giver as a result. Although April 19th has been set aside as Education and Sharing Day, its theme and message is relevant every day of the year. Even today, let us reflect on our collective obligation and opportunity to enhance the true education of our children, to serve as proper role models, and to take concrete action to bring more goodness and kindness into our world. May God bless your efforts to make a brighter future for everyone in our city and beyond, and may the merit of your crucial work welcome God's blessings in your personal lives as well for good health, success, and happiness.
Thank you very much. May I please have Cargill and P, W, and U please come forward? Thank you to Cargill and our friends at the Public Works and Utilities Department of the City of Wichita. This proclamation reads, whereas the celebration of National Earth Day can take many forms, the City of Wichita's premier environmental event takes place along the Arkansas River with dedicated and passionate volunteers from across Cedric County. And whereas the Arkansas River trash cleanup is a 23-year tradition to clean up Wichita's greatest natural water resource. And whereas the 2024 Arkansas River trash cleanup will increase water quality, protect the animals that call the river home, enhance Wichita's image, and safeguard all communities downstream from Derby to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Lily Wu, Mayor of the City of Wichita, along with the Wichita City Council, do hereby proclaim April 27th, 2024, as Arkansas River Trash Cleanup Day in the city of Wichita, and encourage all citizens to celebrate Earth Day by participating in the Arkansas River Trash Cleanup to help make our city a beautiful place to live, work, and play. Just a few words. Uh, the fact that this has taken place for 23 years and the mayor and the council have supported that work on the Ark River for that duration of time is fantastic. Each year in about 90 minutes of time, our volunteers remove over three tons of debris from the river. So if you start to add that up uh, by the years, we've removed a lot of litter that has blown in and washed in and kept it out of the downstream communities. So please come out, enjoy the, the uh, great food that Cargill brings, uh, Wagon Masters will be cooking, and um, while they last, the most soft, glorious t-shirts this year, uh, made from organic cotton and recycled materials because we like to practice what we preach. So thank you. May I please ask our friends at Wichita State University and Berlin to please come forward now? Good morning. You can have everyone come forward. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I like this crowd. I thank you so very much for joining us this morning. Uh, we have a special recognition, and I know that I'll be joining you all this evening, so I'm really looking forward to, uh, to getting back to my alma mater of Wichita State University. The city of Wichita, in recognition of Wichita State University's Barton School of Business, issues this certificate of recognition for the 20-year partnership between Wichita State University and the HWR Berlin School of Economics and Law. Both institutions have forged a strong bond through extensive educational collaboration, including transatlantic student exchanges. Thank you so much, Mayor Wu. Thank you so much, Wichita, for those 20 years. It was an amazing ride. We never expected that when 20 years ago, I was so fortunate to meet the professors and deans of WSU. Actually, at my very first uh, visit to Wichita and my very last moment before I took off to Boston, 
we had a uh, lunch meeting and we thought, what can we do to bring our schools together, to bring our cities together? We talk about international management. Why can't we do international management with our MBA students? And so we set up a project that until now has served more than 120 companies from Wichita and Berlin, establishing business across the Atlantic. We have had more than 300 students coming from Berlin or from Wichita, meeting each other, joining in uh, consulting teams with a high professional background. I don't know any other MBA program, not in the United States, not in Europe, that has really done so much for the real work together. It's not only education or study visits, it's real working together. And it's a real pleasure to do this with the city of Wichita. Thank you so much, Meiru. Thank you so much, Wichita and all the city members. The cup reads, uh, Berlin Professional School, grow personally, professionally. So thank you very, very much for joining us uh, this morning and look forward to sharing more this evening. May I please ask Regina Miller to please come forward. along with former city council member Levanta Williams. Thank you for joining us this morning. This recognition reads, the city of Wichita, in recognition of Helen Miller, issues this certificate of recognition for all she achieved throughout her life and specifically for early childhood education. She embodied the values of Wichita through her many years of service to Wichita children as the founder of Trail Blazers Academy. Helen was my late daughter. Thank you, Mayor Wu, the city council members, city of Wichita licensing, whom Helen loved dearly. Uh, we always partnered with the city. We, we, we knew it was best for children, and we strive to do the best education practices every day. I know Helen's in heaven, watching down and rejoicing that her legacy will not be forgotten and that more children in the city of Wichita will continue to benefit from Trailblazers Academy. God bless you all. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Mayor Wu, uh, city council members. Um, my mom just put me up here to speak. I don't, I don't have a speech written, but I do know that every step of the way for the last two years, my mom and dad have done everything humanly possible um, to keep my sister's legacy alive. And her legacy does live on. Um, 13 years ago, she introduced me to my beautiful wife. Um, the many uh, people that she's impacted here in the city is, is still felt um, to this day. Um, I know that it's, it comes full circle sometimes and we laugh at it because my mom has been in early childhood education for over 40 years. Um, my sister um, got into early childhood education because of my mom at 18 years old. So for over 18 years, um, my sister has given her all to early childhood education. Um, I know this is going to go on Facebook, so I don't want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will just say just thank you all. Um, they gave me a tissue. Thank you all um, for, for everything, um, and we truly do appreciate it. And again, my sister's legacy does live on, 
and uh, we just strive to do everything that she embodied. Thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us for the proclamations and awards this morning. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Hassam Mahdi, Human Life. Good morning, good morning, Mayor, Council uh, members. Of course, this says a human life. Uh, no prepared speech at all. I'll talk to you from the heart. Uh, I've sat with uh, most of you, Council Johnson, Ms. Tuttle, Ms. Ballard. We set several events uh, together. No, Mr. Glasgow, too, uh, SGA, several times. Unfortunately, with the other gentleman, not yet, but we will. God willing, and Mayor, too. Um, I'm of Palestinian descent. I am actually from Gaza. Refugee, you can call it four times now. Uh, left Gaza in the war, was born in Kuwait because my dad has to flee. So refugee to Kuwait. Desert storm happens. Some of you are younger that don't know what desert storm is. Uh, refugee to Syria, Syria to the United States. Proud citizen of the United States of America and definitely love the city of Wichita. I also want to thank you for this platform to allow us to say, talk to you. I am in public service. I know it's very hard. One day I might sit in your seat, uh, sometime maybe mayor even. Because it's from the heart, and I know you guys are good-hearted people, so today I'm talking to you about human life. Human life is very sincere and sacred to all of us, specifically children and women. And what's going on over there uh, on a daily basis, some of you that might follow some of my accounts, and I follow some of yours, so you might get my news feed or you might get. I lose probably a family member now almost on a weekly basis. Cousin, nephew, niece, lost my aunts early on in the first of the conflict. Uh, don't sleep well, don't eat well, uh, guilt trip, all the time, you'd be chosen uh, to be the person that would have a good life. Still have a lot of faith. That's not, nothing of short that we need uh, to help. I know uh, this is local to the city of Wichita. I know uh, our tax dollars and some people also has to go to the city of Wichita as well. It goes to the state and from the state there on to the federal government. So the guilt trip is that what I pay in taxes goes and kills some of these, my nieces and my nephews and my uncles and my aunts. And I don't want that. And I know there are other people on the other side that are hurting uh, that you might support or Mayor, Mula, uh, Mayor Wu, sorry, last time said that she has emails that people call for no ceasefire. Why is the no ceasefire? Why not? Why not if it's going to stop bloodshed? that's been going on to 1948. My father, my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, and his grandfather has names that still own, owns that land that we've been kicked off. And I'm not here to discuss a political issue, don't have much time left, but now we're about 37,000 people dead. And every day as we speak right now, there's people losing their lives, some are wounded, some are in hospitals, some lost limbs. Some will never recover from the, the hurt that they have. Um, oh, 37,000, so we're feeling numb because we see it every day. So I'll give you a specific story real quick. Someone that, because it touches our hearts when we have a kid, you have a grandchild, and you have a grandchild, and then this grandchild is, after you braid their hair as a small girl and you love her, you watch her while the mom is going to work and trying to get some uh, food on the table. 
and then she dies in a bombing. It has nothing to do with anything. Then he lifts her up, her grandpa, and says, and, and that's famous, and you've probably seen that video, some of you that like to watch, and he said, you are the soul of my soul. How does that touch your heart? Now that becomes closer to home. I urge you to have a ceasefire. It's not binding to anybody. It's just all it is is a human being stop shed of life. It doesn't mean you support one way or the other. You support human life and human beings. So what is the good thing that we're going to do? We're going to now bring refugees over from Gaza to make up for what we've done, just like we've done before in Vietnam, and we've done before in Somalia, and we've done before in many other places. We bring them as refugees in Bosnia, and probably Ukraine now, and we are accepting people from Yemen, from Afghanistan while we've been there. So are we, is, that what we, is that the solution after we do? So I urge you, please, look at it, think about it. It's human people, it's human life, it's people like you and me that suffer on every day. And as we speak right now, somebody is dead. Thank you for the time today. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Maria Preshka, City of Wichita, total ceasefire resolution for Gaza. Hello, my name is Maria and I am here this morning on behalf of an organization called Free Palestine ICT. Organization implores the city of Wichita to pass a total ceasefire resolution for Gaza. As of today, there are over 33,600 confirmed dead civilians, 40% of which are children, and this is still considered a wildly incorrect undercount, incomplete count. Thus far, all hospitals in Gaza have been bombed, raided, or attacked. 26 of the civilian housing hospitals have been completely destroyed. That is 72% of their hospitals with the remaining 10 partially functioning hospitals cut off from water, power, and modern medicine. Children are suffering from infected limbs that would have otherwise been easily treated, being sawed off with no anesthesia. They are quite literally biting the bullet. Newborn babies have no access to formula. Mothers and children have no access to food or water. They are dying of starvation right in front of our eyes. Mind you, the starvation of civilians as a method of warfare is strictly prohibited per the Geneva Conventions, yet very few seem to care. And our community has a direct role in this atrocity being committed against mankind. Furthermore, I would like to address a concern brought forth by Councilmember Glasscock, <clears throat> in which he stated in an email to one of his constituents that the city of Wichita does not, quote, involve ourselves in foreign affairs, end quote, and that she should, quote, please reach out to your Congress member or Senator, end quote. I firmly disagree with the notion that Wichita is not involved in foreign affairs, and I am appalled at the implication that local government should not be involved in foreign affairs due to the fact that in the age of globalization, there is no such thing as isolation. As you all know, Wichita is one of the is one of the epicenters of our nation's military industrial complex. Israel's Air Force currently uses numerous airplanes produced by Textron to murder, bomb, and terrorize the Palestinian population. They also use tankers and aircraft produced by Lockheed Martin, which has a significant partnership with Wichita State University. Many of our majors here at WSU feed into the maw of our military industries. Right now, as we speak, equipment designed within the WSU campus is being used to slaughter Palestinian civilians and children. Aerospace majors design the planes and weapons of war that which they use. English majors write their instructions. Human factors majors make them comfortable and practical to use. Computer science majors program their guidance systems. Graphic design majors make them pretty and digestible for the public. And political science majors sell genocide to the public. Whether you care to admit it or not, Wichita, our aviation industry, its history, and our community is intrinsically immersed in the ongoing genocide in Gaza, as well as every other modern war we have fought. City Council members, you have the opportunity, the power, and a voice to take a stand for martyred children to make history and be on the right side of it. Silence is compliance. The longer we wait to pass a ceasefire resolution, the longer our community is complicit in genocide. 
That is why over 100 U.S. localities have passed their own ceasefire resolutions, including 12 major cities, and is why today we implore you to do the same. Council, member, <clears throat> Council members Johnson, Hoheisel, and Ballard, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for saying that you would support a ceasefire and an end to genocide. Council members Glasscock, Johnston, Tuttle, and Mayor Wu, I hope you genuinely think about and reflect upon what I've said today. Thank you for your time and free Palestine. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Kate Foss, Pickleball in Riverside. Good morning, Mayor Wu and City Council members. My name is Kate Foss, and I lived in Wichita for almost 30 years. I'm a board member of the United States Tennis Association Missouri Valley uh, Section Board, which is the governing board. USTA is the governing board of, the United, of tennis for the United States. I'm also a board member of the Maureen Conley Brinker Tennis Foundation of Kansas and of the Wichita Community Tennis Board. I'm also a, president, a past president of the United States Kansas District. I started playing tennis on the public courts in my hometown as a grade school student. I'm the parent of a tennis player, a former USTA league captain and player. My family has hosted six tennis players during their high school exchange years here in Wichita, as well as many college students when they were here to play in the Wichita Tennis Open. Simply said, I love tennis. I'm here today to respond to things I heard in the City Council workshop on March 28, 2024. I was disheartened to hear that the plans for the new approved pickleball complex in South Wichita may be set aside, and that Riverside should be considered as an alternative location for pickleball. Tennis is booming, especially in the Missouri Valley section of the United States Tennis Association. Pickleball is an exciting, newer sport and is also booming. Pickleball deserves its own dedicated space. A dedicated space, as planned in South Wichita, could serve the local community as well as out-of-town players that would travel to Wichita for tournaments. I think both tennis players and pickleball players would agree on this. If there is any expansion at Riverside, it should be for tennis, so we can build on the success better serve the tennis community and draw more and larger tournaments to Wichita. Tennis is growing. In fact, last week, the United States Tennis Association stated that their goal is to have 35 million players in the United States by the year 2035. It's an ambitious goal, but it's attainable, in part if tennis is supported by local communities. Tennis has lost too many tennis courts to pick a ball and pickleball should have their own dedicated space so you don't keep taking more of the pie from tennis to serve pickleball. As you may not be aware, both Topeka, with a population of 127,000 people, according to the 2022 census, and Salina, with about 46,000 people, each have a public facility with more tennis courts than we have in Wichita. I was surprised when I looked at their, their population and compared it to Wichita because they're both significantly smaller than Wichita. If there's any further discussion about converting tennis courts over to pickleball courts, I ask that the tennis community be included in those discussions. The 2022 reno renovation at Riverside included six pickleball courts and tennis court expansion as well as renovation and additional items, and it was partially funded by the Maureen Conley Brinker Tennis Foundation of Wichita with a $403,000 donation. Maureen Conley, Kansas's tennis goal is to support and encourage the development of skills for life that promote healthy lifestyle through tennis programs. For the last 50 years, MCB Kansas has fundraised to make a positive impact of the greater Wichita community by supporting youth tennis. Each year, we funded local programs and annually saved 10% of our proceeds to fund a larger project. That project was Riverside. You should have all received uh, an email with a memor memorandum of understanding with the details. If for any reason you choose to trade tennis courts for pickleball courts at Riverside, we respectfully request our contribution back 
so we can invest in tennis elsewhere in our community. Thank you for your attention and time, and please reach out if you have any questions. I have one question for staff. Um, the statistic that was just mentioned regarding more tennis courts in Topeka and Salina than in Wichita. Can we get data regarding that, please? Thank you very much. Lily, excuse me, Mayor. I, I was saying that it was not the total number of courts, but a larger single facility. Can we, can we get that data so we can put it up as, as just information? City managers to doubt. Thank you very much. Madam Clerk, please call the next. Mayor, oh, Mayor actually. Will, <clears throat> with a motion, um, I would motion that we extend public comment up to 10 more minutes remaining. We're only at 14 now. If there is anybody else that wants to speak in public comment. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 6-0, oh, 7-0. We now have 10 minutes for any individual who would like to come up and speak. Maximum of five minutes per individual. I did not prepare a speech, but I want to introduce myself. I did write a letter. I'm Julie Ryan, and I'm the current chair of the Maureen Connolly Brinker Foundation. And just to share a little bit, a bit about her, um, you think, why, why, who is this lady? But she was the world number one many years ago, and um, her career ended at the age of 18. She had won 51 Grand Slams in a row. She was gonna, going to be very dominant, but she um, came to that because her community supported her. Her community of San Diego supported her skill set. So what we have done in uh, taking her namesake is we believe that community should support kids and healthy lifestyles and give back. So we've done this. We're the only city in the country that has such a philanthropic organization that supports youth tennis. One of the um, programs that we support, in addition to the city of Wichita Summer Activity Camp for Kids, where we have over 2,000 kids every year going through summer kids programs. Um, and we have the NJTL, um, National Junior Tennis League president and president of USTA, Alex Lee here. Um, he goes real deep with um, many of the kids that would not have any opportunity to play tennis um, at McAdams Park. Um, just, I just think that we should be proud of our community efforts and of the things that we're able to provide um, our, our kids in the community, but also um, just all kids in our, our uh, community public parks. We're really proud of Riverside. We wanted to make it our premier tennis facility for Wichita. We are lacking, when you go along the I-35 corridor, um, a competitive tennis, uh, service that our other communities have. So we see the tournaments going everywhere but Wichita. They drive right by Wichita. So as Kate briefly alluded to, for 50 years, 10% of our proceeds were saved to expand, specifically to expand Riverside. And we are so proud to work with the city to get that expansion completed. And it's utilized. It's a success. It's great. Um, and we love, many of us play pickleball too. We love sports. We, we aren't opposed to pickleball, but don't take away our tennis. Um, it's heavily utilized. It's heavily invested in. It's a success. We would like to even see that grow further and have, be more competitive. So I appreciate you following up on that so that you can see we have opportunity still with our tennis. Instead of taking away from it, we still have our opportunity for it. So I appreciate your time. And I appreciate all, all of you for what you do to the community. So thank you for listening. Anyone else? 
from the community? Hi, I'm Alex Lee. I'm the president of the USTA Missouri Valley section. That's the five state area. And um, I'm also the tennis coach at Fringe University. We use Riverside, so does Newman University. And the 11 courts that we have there now is really not enough. We need more courts. And in the 70s, Riverside was one of the premier tennis facilities in the United States. But now all the other cities have built more tennis courts and Riverside has not. So if we want to keep up with the other cities and states, we, we need to invest more in tennis facilities because tennis is about the youth of America. And we'd like to see a U.S. Open champion come out of here. Three million dollars, you know. And uh, so I, I think tennis is, is, uh, uh, is one of our major youth sports. So, and at McAdams, I run the NJTL there, and we focus more on the youth of America and building character and sportsmanship in them. So, and that's why I focus more on tennis. So, and I do play pickleball also, but tennis is the main sport. So. Uh, we can have one more speaker, if anyone wants to come forward. If not, we will close public agenda. Madam Clerk, can you please call the next item? Consent agenda items 1 through 20. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent agenda? I see none. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? Mayor, with a motion to approve the consent agenda items, items 1 through 20. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? I see none. Oh, I do see one. Uh, Council Member John Stunn. I have a question. Is, is, is the uh, building where the homeless shelter is that in consent agenda? It's not. Okay. Good. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7 0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Board of Bids and Contracts dated April 8th, 2024. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Josh Lauber, Department of Finance. The Board of Bids and Contracts dated for April 8, 2024 are as follows. <clears throat> for engineering, we have paving for Commerce Street and St. Francis Avenue from Waterman to Kellogg for Prado Construction LLC in the amount of $5,061,476.75. We have the Wichita Valley Center Local Flood Protection Project Levy F Tow Drain Installation Phase 1 for Apex Excavating LLC in the amount of $575,555. For purchasing, we have the high pressure sewer cleaner trucks for Elliott Equipment Company Group 1 in the amount of $365,884 and Group 2 for $398,827. We have three quarter ton and stake bed trucks for Rusty Eck Ford Incorporated Group one in the amount of $78,891 and group two in the amount of $86,997. We have the license track software annual renewal for July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025 for Progressive Solutions Incorporated in the amount of $65,469.21. We have the phone system hardware and software maintenance annual renewal for May 1st, 2024 through April 30th, 2025 for Unify Incorporated in the amount of $139,514.16. And 
and we have the ARC GIS software annual renewal for May 3rd, 2024 through May 2nd, 2025 for Environmental Systems Research Incorporated in the amount of $83,525.84. This is how to become a vendor with the City of Wichita. These are open request proposals out on the street today. And I'd be happy to try to answer any of your questions. I recommend your approval. Vice Mayor Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a question. Can you go back to slide four, please? Sure. I was just looking at the bids, 3.8 million and 575. Did somebody not understand the assignment? Like, how is that possible? Uh, thank you for the question, Council Member. I mean, it's just so significant that I'm sorry I have to ask. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question, Council Member Ballard. Um, I had to ask myself, the, the biggest issue that I saw was Meriden Partners LLC, they're a new vendor to us, they're out of state, based out of Denver, Colorado. So you're gonna see a lot of that cost based on mobilization and bringing in labor. Um, we also saw with Wildcat and NOAC, um, their possibility could be anticipated costs. Uh, Apex Excavating, we asked on two separate occasions at my request that they understood the scope of work, they understood the assignment, and they could complete the work as requested um, and we also have uh, many projects with Apex Excavating not um, having any concerns with their work. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Good question. Any further questions for staff? I see none. Thank you, Josh. Is there a motion to approve the Board of Bids this contract? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please open the door. Motion passes 7 0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. <clears throat> FY 2023 Fire Prevention and Safety Grant. Good morning, Mayor, City Council members, Tammy Snow, Fire Chief, here today um, to present to you um, uh, the, our, our intentions with the fiscal year 2023 Fire Prevention and Safety Grant and to ask for your approval for, to support it. Um, the Fire Prevention and Safety Grant, um, it provides a, a, the resources uh, and the opportunity for us to enhance and bolster our fire prevention, our education, and our investigation sections of the department. Uh, one of their primary goals is uh, to um, produce uh, robust and efficient building inspections um, to allow us to do pre-planning and to also enhance our fire code reviews, um, which includes the identification of dangerous and or non-conforming conditions. Um, our grant history with this particular grant is um, in fiscal year 2020, we were able to obtain the fire investigation grant for a little over $1 million. What that did for us was allow us to train and provide some succession planning within our fire investigation unit. Also, we allowed, or it allowed us to, to obtain some certifications so that currently at Station 5, it's what we call kind of our learning center for fire investigators, but those members have been through that training. And so um, if they're not one of the first units on scene, they can help us with origin and cause um, at, at specific fires. The second grant was uh, fiscal year 2021. It's our community risk and reduction grant. We obtained a little over $500,000, and that one allowed us to start a um, certification program in fire inspections um, with our operations personnel. Um, the reason why that becomes important to us is this grant right here. Um, what we're asking for in this particular grant is to continue that um, education program. Um, the first program, um, we, we were able to um, train 70 out of our 131 fire officers in fire inspection. Uh, we'd like to continue that momentum. Um, out of those, uh, we'd like to continue with uh, uh, the four personnel that we identified in the first grant. We'd utilize them again to continue to uh, train the remaining officers for us. Um, this would then uh, allow us to put those officers out on the street 
And uh, we have a little over 17,000 uh, building inspections that would allow us to help uh, our, our uh, community risk reduction inspectors do those inspections um, and also do some very um, low risk um, operational permits. So um, this is the only grant that allows us to supplant. None of our other grants uh, for staffing um, allow some plantions, but this one does. Um, and so we're going to ask, we would like to ask for a total of $574,268 for those four individuals' wages. Um, it's a 95.5%, meaning that the federal government will give us 95% of the money if we are awarded it. And out of our budget, then it would cost us $48,713. Um, federal then would produce $525,555. So with that, um, I will ask, uh, my recommendation is to authorize the submission of the grant, and um, I'll stand for questions. I'm really hoping I'm doing my math right, because otherwise this will be embarrassing too. Um, so I was looking at the percentage of the 5% local match, and out of the 574,000 or the 525,000 requested, 5% would be 26,000 around there, depending on the number. And so I was just wondering where the 48,000 versus the 5% match. You're, yeah, I'll have to go back and double check. I just okay. uh, trusted staff to give me okay. the numbers. So. I don't know if I'm, I'll double check my math and I'll come back in just a second. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I'll double check too, because sometimes it's maybe 5% per year. I, uh, let me double check. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wanted to know, uh, oh, council member Hoheis. All right. Thank you, mayor. Um, this is a recurring grant? No, it's or, not recurring. We can, uh, um, let me define it. We have to apply every year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. What we want to do is take it to phase two, because the first time that we obtained it was back in 2021, fiscal year. Last year, we didn't obtain the grant. This year, we'd like to bolster or continue that program that we had two years ago. Okay, so we applied last year, but we didn't get the grant. No, we didn't get it, the grant. We okay. We did not receive it. Okay, so... Uh, all right, so we feel pretty good about this year. I, I, it's always in God's hands, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Chief. Chief, so back in 2021 when it did get approved, um, we got that grant, but then how did we pay for it when we did not get the grant? How do we pay for it? It was, again, a matching one, so it comes out of the general operating budget of ours whatever the match is, and then we get the federal funds, pay the rest of it. Is that what you're asking? Did I answer your question? Okay. I know moving forward, um, since this is a yearly application, if we don't get it next year, how we will supplement. Um, obviously, right now we get the 5% local match that we pay, but if we don't get it next year, how will we pay for the 574000 moving forward? It... If it, we don't get the grant, then the program ends. You know, make sure that that was something that people understood, that this is being supplemented because there's a grant only. That's correct. Um, so I know that we're going to face a lot of difficult decisions moving forward, and I just want to be mindful that when we are approving these, that the recurring costs uh, continues to be something that we are considering uh, when it comes to the general yeah, it's just an opportunity to provide an opportunity for professional development and education to our personnel. But if we don't get the grant, then the program ends. Thank you. Mayor. Any further questions for staff? Mayor. I see none. Mayor, Councilmember Glasscock deserves a gold star today. Um, there's a $20,000 error. Um, uh, what it should be, it, uh, the local match should be twenty eight seven. 13 and the grant amount should be 545,555. So a $20,000 swing. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. And I appreciate both of you. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I, I did text Councilmember Glasscock those numbers. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Helping behind the scenes. <laughs> Councilmember Ho Heisel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, was that a, just a typo on that error? 
Well, uh, the mistake and, was made on both sides, so it was, it was somebody miscalculated. I'm not quite sure where that came from. Did we include that 48,000 in our application, or have we applied? I haven't. I haven't drilled down. We haven't applied yet. That. Yeah. The application deadline is 5 o'clock on Friday, so uh, come to you guys for approval first before we hit the, the send button. So, no, we have not included that amount yet. Okay, yeah, we might use some white out on that application. <laughs> okay. Very good. Any further questions for staff? I see none. Thank you, Chief. It is time for public comment. Anyone from the public who would like to speak on this matter? I see none. Bring it back to the bench. Council Member Holheisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if we pass this, should we make an amendment to re reflect the, the typo there, the, the accounting error? The project cost is accurate. So I, I think that's good enough if you will. Uh, we'll, we've caught it, so. Okay. Any further questions or comments? I see none. There's a motion by Council Member Glasscock. Thank you, Mayor Wu. Uh, with a motion that the City Council authorize submission and acceptance for the fiscal year 2023 FPNS program for fire investigation, personnel expenses, and authorize the necessary signatures reflective of the new information as well. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? See none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Payment for settlement of claim. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Jennifer Magania, City Attorney. Um, the item before you, um, is the payment of a settlement of claim, but I'd like to provide first a brief background on the subject of the lawsuit. Uh, state law in the criminal statutes uh, defines criminal street gang, criminal street gang member, and criminal street gang associate, and the criteria for being designated as a member or associate. Um, since 2010, um, these laws have been on the books and WPD has followed them. Um, the statute also includes uh, provisions for bail and sentencing enhancements for crimes committed by gang members. Following these state laws, uh, WPD, like other jurisdictions, has maintained and compiled criminal investigation records regarding gangs and gang members. Uh, these records are created and maintained as criminal investigative records, and the WPD's database serves as an important criminal intelligence function and allows police to act in a proactive way to solve crimes. Um, WD, WPD Policy 527 provides guidelines on how information is maintained, used, and disseminated, requiring officers to follow the state statutes. It allows for persons to be removed from the list with three years of no new gang activity. <clears throat> uh, in April of 21, uh, the city uh, was filed, a lawsuit was filed against the city of Wichita, naming the city as a defendant as well as then Chief Ramsey and uh, police captain. Uh, now the lawsuit is simply against the city of Wichita as a defendant. This claim was brought by Progeny, a program of Destination Innovations, Inc., uh, Christopher Cooper, Albert Mar Costello, Martel Costello, and Jeremy Levy, Jr. This case was filed in U.S. District Court and is set for trial next month. This case was filed uh, as a Section 1983 actions, alleging violations of the First and Fourteenth Amendments. Uh, the plaintiffs assert that Wichita Police Department's policies and practices implementing the state law uh, through the creation and maintenance of this database of gang members uh, are uh, believed to be members, or those people are believed to be associates, violate plaintiffs' due rights to due process, equal protection, and freedom of expression and association under the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution. The lawsuit also sought to dissolve the gang database and sought and received class certification for those people who are affected. Which, like I said, has followed the state law with regard to this gang database. Prior to the lawsuit being filed, the Wichita Police Department was in the process of implementing improvements to the database and WPD Policy 527. 
The filing of the lawsuit created a risk for the city of paying attorney's fees for what's called prevailing party status. This settlement now before you would allow WPD to now move forward with improvements in the process and policies that it has. The terms of the agreement, uh, settlement agreement that's proposed include $550,000 for plaintiff's attorney's fees and costs. Uh, $75,000 of the bonding resolution, which is $625,000, would go for the three years of a special master to provide oversight of the implementation of new policies under the policy 527, the settlement agreement. Um, along with this, the city will uh, implement a new record system for um, this database. There will be a gang review ombudsman who is a civilian you will appoint for two-year terms to assist with individuals who are on this list. Um, the criteria in the list will be clarified. Under uh, the agreement, policy 527 will be revised and um, there will be additions to that that provide a clear process to review one's status. Um, to provide the ability to contest inclusion or continuation in the database every 18 months for an individual who believes they're wrongfully in the database. Um, in addition, it will remove inactive members and associate members' names and in the categories of inactive and associate members. WPD will pu publish aggregate data from the audits, not disclosing information related to any one individual, but will provide aggregate data that, that um, results from its audits and will provide training on the policy to um, WD, WPD officers. Um, this agreement would provide a release of all claims and the rights to appeal, but it is subject to the approval of federal court, so it is not final until the federal court has a hearing on this matter. Today, the item before, your, um, for, item before you is the settlement of claim and the authorization of payment and the adoption of the bonding resolution, and it is the recommendation that you take the recommended action today. I'm available for questions, as is uh, WPD Chief Beard. Um, if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Council Member Ho. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just one quick question. We indicate that we're gonna allow the public to be able to look themselves up uh, to see if they're on this list. Is it just the individuals or can other people look up and see if a particular individual's on there? Okay. Chief Beard, we'd like to talk about that. I'm gonna ask Chief Beard, who is the subject matter expert on this. All right, appreciate it. Councilman, um, in reference to that, uh, part of the settlement will, will allow for a uh, individual's uh, personal and identified attorney uh, to seek uh, what their uh, status is. An individual may also come and, and uh, with proper identification, be able to seek uh, if uh, what their status is. And then a parent, if they are uh, if properly identified and have identified their child, uh, they may also come and request uh, to, to look at that. Um, if anybody's worried, again, it will only provide what their status is and then uh, what the criteria that were met uh, for that. In addition to that, we will also provide uh, intervention and prevention uh, information um, uh, to them if that individual is already documented, uh, and then uh, information about uh, the appeal process as well. Okay, so pretty much the personal information is just contained to the party and whoever they have designated to speak on their behalf. Correct. We'll actually have a form that they complete, and it must be done within 30 days uh, upon the review of us to provide that information. And then if they, uh, after that, they have the right for an appeal um, uh, to go before the omnibusman person uh, to, uh, to request a hearing uh, in reference to their status. Okay, appreciate it. Thank You're you, welcome. Captain. Absolutely. Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one quick question, Captain. Um, should all of this happen today with council vote, will there be uh, any outreach from us to identify members on the gang file, much like we did in 2017? House. Yes, that would be the, the, the process is that we will go through, uh, apply the new criteria uh, based on this settlement, and then we will um, make the notifications as required by the settlement. Yes, so it'll be a little bit of an initial process. It won't happen like tomorrow. Uh, we'll have to take some time, go through it, and conduct a, essentially a second audit, uh, making sure that the new criteria that individuals meet, meet that, and then we will send out notifications. Okay, could we um, also, I, I know for a time with uh, Lieutenant Gilmore, we had 
think we put out the number to the gang unit for folks who had just kind of heard about some policy change and wanted mm -hmm. to call in and see, and they had to be verified, I think, by Social Security number and all that when they called right. in. Will that be a part of the process as well? Yes, and I'm not 100% uh, sure. I don't want to give you misinformation, but, yeah, we will uh, – we will make sure that obviously a request is done. Uh, we, there's a specific form. That form will be requested. So there will be no more longer people just calling on the phone or sending an email where we can't verify who they are. So we'll want that form completed. Uh, that will give us a record in, uh, of, of that as well for all the requests. Again, if we want to provide a aggregate data as to how many people requested their uh, status, we could then provide that to the public as well. Um, but. Uh, there will be the, the form that will be completed, make sure that it's completed uh, completely, and then make sure that that person's verified, again, if it's a parent or their, uh, their counsel, uh, so that we know that they are, are authorized to receive the information, and then we'll provide that information to them, whether that's in a, uh, a formal visit um, or a Zoom call, wh whatever works for them. We'll, I think we're going to make try to make arrangements so that they get the information they, they need, um, but we prefer face-to-face. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Captain Beard, I see no further questions, but I have a couple. Absolutely. Um, I know about Second Chance Thursdays, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great opportunity for the community uh, if they have uh, any warrants, uh, they can get them cleared as long as they're not criminal in the right. future. Um, this might be a great opportunity in future months mm -hmm. to maybe have a Second Chance Thursday uh, with the additional portions that you mentioned wanting to see people face to face and verify that that really is the individual, could there be a possibility to maybe partner with Second Chance Thursday? I would think so, yes. I don't wanna uh, speak out of turn without knowing all the things about Second Chance, but I think that could be a, a, a very good possibility that we could offer you know, one Thursday out, out of some time that we would allow for people to submit a request or have the paperwork there present so that they could submit the, uh, the request for them if they, if they thought they're on the list. I think that would be a, good, a very good option. Thank you, Captain Beard. Yep. Uh, Jennifer, a couple questions for you. Um, the recommendation, I know, in the presentation was the $550,000, but yes. in our sheets is the six hundred. Yes, let me address that once again. The $625,000 is the bonding resolution. We are bonding that amount. Of that is the 550000 which will go toward plaintiffs, as the settlement for fees and costs. The other $75,000 is to set aside for the costs of the special master who the city will engage for a three-year period, and we estimate that cost to be $75,000. So it's a combined amount that we bonded. So thank you for, for clarifying that. And then a couple more questions for you, Jennifer. Um, this is just one of many lawsuits the city of Wichita currently is facing. Uh, do you know just the number of lawsuits the city is being named as a uh, plaintiff? Yeah, well, there are, there are, you know, it depends on the category. There's everything from workers' comp to personal injury, general tort claims, all types. I mean, I, I don't have a number right now. I mean, I think you could say 30 to 60 at any time. Um, we have currently posted online um, the active civil lawsuits. We've excluded some some other categories, but we've, we've posted those. So they are available on the website um, with uh, the caption of each case, and that's available. Can you tell us where that's at? Um, thanks to communications, it's available at www.gov. I can't think of the actual um, link that gets there, but I bet Tyler would be able to give that information because he was very quick and helpful in getting that done. I will ask uh, communications to send that to us so that we can share that on our social media pages if people want to know. Uh, I did get questions asked about how many lawsuits the city of Wichita currently faces, mm -hmm. and you said safely 30 to 60. Yeah, I mean, in, in depending on the category, I'm thinking civil, you know, the civil, typical civil lawsuit against us. There's other ones like work comp or, um, you know, appeals and things like um, from other ordinances, but that's, that's a general number. It changes from time to time. And can you tell us a rough estimate of the cost to the city? Of defending all our lawsuits? Um, I don't have that number in in hand at the moment. We do have different funding sources depending on the lawsuit. Some are from the, the self-insurance fund, some tort claims fund. So I can get that information for you and make that available. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Council Member Glasscock. Mayor, I just had the chance to go to wichita.gov backslash law. Great. That's very easy. Law. And on the left side, there's a thing, an item that says pending lawsuits. Great. So it takes two clicks. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for staff? 
I see none. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's time for public comment on this item. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak? I see none. We'll bring it back to the bench. I see no council member. Is there a motion to approve this payment for settlement? I would move that the city council authorize payment of 625,000 in the engagement of a special master as the full settlement of all possible claims arising out of the event, which is the subject of this claim, adopt the bonding resolution and authorize the necessary signatures. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? I see none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Amendment to state, led, or state 2024 legislative agenda. Mayor, with a motion. Um, I move that we table uh, this item indefinitely. Second. Madam Clerk, uh, any further discussion? I see none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Sale of city-owned property at 2220 East 21st Street. Good morning. My name is Jerry Ford. I'm with a I'm a real estate agent with the city's Real Estate Services Division. Today I bring you an item regarding the sale of a property at 2220 East 21st Street. A little background about this property. In 1996, the city entered into a partnership with Cessna to develop this property as a life skill training facility. This particular property also was facilitated with a daycare center. That program ended in 2015, and after Cessna's exit in 2015, the city of Wichita declared the property surplus and another tenant was in occupancy of the building through October of 2023. The building itself is comprised of 19,798 square feet and it is improved with offices and classrooms. There's an office space that's improved as an operating uh, for the operation of a daycare and almost half of the building itself is an area designated for warehousing storage and light assembly. The site is approximately 2.66 acres and it is zoned limited commercial. Other organizations along Opportunity Drive include United Methodist First Pantry, Food Pantry, the Boys and Girls Club of South Central Kansas, and Top Learning Center. This is just an overall site plan of the property and a street view of the property. I'm sure everybody's familiar with it already, having it um, have the interim use be in the emergency winter shelter. In September of 23, in anticipation of the tenant's pending relocation, the city initiated the solicitation of a request for proposals to seek a new user to either buy or lease the property. When the need for this location became known as the possible siting for the emergency winter shelter, the RFP timelines were extended to allow for the operation of the EWS. The extended timeline also allowed for interested parties to plan for the building to be occupied as an emergency winter shelter through the March of 2024. The RFP itself sought an applicant with the ability to demonstrate the qualifications of the RFP, competence and capacity of a new user seeking to occupy the property. RFP criteria included an outline of plans for the designated space, including a discussion of the use of the property, type of industry that would be in operation, and an overview of how the use will benefit the overall community enrichment efforts of the city. A description of the applicant's history with specific emphasis on growth of their current business, commitment letters with terms and conditions for financing, if the applicant is in a partnership, a copy of the partnership is to be provided showing cash contribu contributions by the general and or limited partners. 
and a resolution of authority from applicable board of directors giving the applicant authority to submit an offer. Financial statement of the applicant and all grantors and general partners was also requested. Four proposals were received. We had two applicants offer to lease the property from the city. All of these leases were for five-year terms. One applicant offered to purchase the property. The fourth applicant offered to purchase the property only as a second option to leasing the property. So they submitted a proposal for both. The staff selection committee invited three of the four applicants to make a presentation and be interviewed by the selection committee panel. The panel was comprised of staff from the city manager's office real estate services division, the city manager's office of community services, the law department, finance, housing and community services, and we had a representative from the Northeast Millair Neighborhood Association participate in, on this panel. Applicant want proposed a lease and requested that the city charge zero rent for their occupancy. This was the one that we did not interview. Applicant two was also proposed a lease with a graduated rental payment schedule starting at 6,000 per annum the first year and 24,000 per annum by year th years three through four, three through five, excuse me. The third applicant proposed to purchase the property for $682,500. This applicant also indicated that they had $300,000 earmarked for building modifications and capital improvements. The fourth applicant proposed to purchase the property for $900,000 as a second option to leasing the property for $56,850 per annum. As a condition to both a lease or a sale, that applicant also required that they have the first right of refusal on four acres of land situated along the west side of Opportunity Drive, city-owned land. Concerned about the fourth applicant's request for a first right of refusal on unsolicited land and the ability to acquire necessary capital to purchase the property, the selection panel selected Habitat for Humanity's proposal to purchase the property for $682,500 or the equivalent of $34.44 per square foot. Generally, 45% of unrestricted proceeds from a sale of surplus property such as this is credited to the funds, Economic Development Fund, and 55% is credited to the general fund. However, Given the lack of infrastructure to support the homelessness and the ongoing efforts to develop a multi-agency center, which includes a navigation center, congregate shelter, and non-congregate sh shelter space, staff recommends that the proceeds from this sale be set aside to fund costs associated with the development of future MAC project or projects. With all four applicants being nonprofit organizations, the sale of the property will not add value into the tax base as stated on the agenda. It does, however, relieve the city of continued maintenance costs. It is recommended that the city council approve the real estate agreement as presented today and authorize the necessary signatures and authorize staff to establish a cash funded project for future use for the MAC. And with that, I stand for questions. Vice Mayor Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a question. Um, it appears that the appraisal came in significantly higher, so I was just curious about that number appearing to be over a million dollars and then accepting yes. 682000 Yes, I understand that most certainly. The county's appraised value of that property did increase from 23 to 24, 53%. I know a lot of people's properties went up in value last year, but 53% is quite a bit. We had a conversation with Sedgwick County Appraiser's Office to find out what caused that, that increase. And they had an inspection done of the property when they went through it in 2023. They saw that the warehouse assembly space was being utilized such as a gymnasium. So that reclassification of the property to a gym from warehouse to gymnasium classroom, um, it, it reclassified the property and caused the property to go up in value. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Can you give the amounts of what it was in 2022 versus 2023? I have the number for 2023, it was 910,000. And I believe it was around 900,000 as well in 2022, but I don't have that in front of me. Appraised value for 2024 then? And then the 2024 county appraised value is 1,392,930. I see no further questions from the bench, but I will ask. Oh, we have Councilman Johnston. Thank you, Mayor. Um, who gave the proposal for the 900,000 and, and the lease? Uh, that was one applicant. Um, are we permitted to disclose? Okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, that is McAdams Academy. Was there discussion with them just outright buying the building without the possibility of an option? Land yes, across the street? that was, yes, sir, most definitely. Um, that was a question that was asked in advance and again at the RFP panel. And they, decide, they said that they had to have that land for future growth. So that was, they could not release that request for first right of refusal. Okay, and what, what plans do we have for that land? Well, that corridor is very much dedicated to social services and education. So the city of Wichita doesn't have immediate plans to develop that property. It's a little over four acres. And so there is some opportunity for some new future social services or programming to be constructed on that. But at this time, there is not a plan for that property. Did they offer a price for the property? No. They just asked for first right of refusal. And really, and if we're going to look at the other properties in the area, um, the Tops property and the Boys and Girls property, a lot of these are usually like $1 a deal type, $1 a year type transactions. And so if we get into a situation where we have a, an offer for another nonprofit agency comes in and they wanna develop that property for a dollar a year, and we have a standing first right of refusal with another party, they can walk in for a dollar, dollar oh one and acquire that property. Uh, Mayor, if I could. Jerry, could you talk about the, their ability to actually pay $900,000 now? That was another concern of the panel that was, it was discussed. Um, they preferred, the, the applicant preferred a lease and suggested that they would have this a lease with the option to purchase that property at 900,000, uh, they would be able to improve their capital campaign and their cash reserves in the interim to be able to finance that property. What you know what their cash reserves are now? Uh, I don't have that handy on hand, but it was substantially less than the other applicants. Was it more or less than 900,000? It was less. Yes. Vice Mayor Ballard. Sorry, thank you, Mayor. I just have another question. Um, just so the public understands, these are RFPs that went out before we moved the emergency shelter in there. So we just kind of put that on pause, these RFPs until the shelter closed. That's correct. We had, initiate, we had anticipated that the, the previous tenant's departure was going to occur in October of 23. So we had started the RFP process in advance of that and then just ended up having to kind of slow it a little bit. And we still worked through the RFP process with the intent to uh, just delay the awarding of the RFP to this time versus at the first of this at the first of January. Do you think that, um, I'm only asking because someone asked a question why we didn't go back out for RFPs after the shelter closed, why we just kind of put it on hold, like potentially maybe there would be somebody else interested. We didn't necessarily put it on hold. What we did was just, we continued to work through the process. We just extended the timelines for it. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Tuttle. Thank you, great job, Jerry. Thank, thank you, you for all your work on this. I appreciate it, I really do. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't write, this, write the slide number down, but if you could go back a few slides where it talks about applicant number three and the amount of their offer. 
Thank you very much. So it says that $682,500 was the price that they proposed. And then can you explain a little bit more about the 300000 that's being earmarked for building modification and capital improvements? Because if you add the 682000 and the 300000 applicant three is actually the highest. Form. Correct. Yes. So can you explain that 300000 so that the community understands what that means? And then I have a follow-up question. Most certainly. This building was originally built in 1996, and therefore its components are also that old as well. And so while the city has done maintenance on the exterior and the major components of the property, a building getting to be 30 years of old, 30 years of age, um, there has to be some anticipation for some major maintenance expenses. But in addition to that, some of that money, I believe, is set aside so they can customize the building to fit their use exactly. Thank you. So it's an improvement and an investment okay. into the building. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I also understand one thing. So um, the applicant three, the third applicant, they have all of their financing secured, and we feel confident that they're going to be able to proceed. Applicant four had questions regarding their ability to make their offer of 900000 Is that correct? Uh, yes, their first preference was for a lease, but it was also that contingency to put a first right of refusal on the, on, four acres. On the land that really um, took, uh, that, that had the panel's interest in the other applicant. Okay, and then I'm going to ask just one kind of general question, um, and you don't need to give me too many specific specifics, but you work in our real estate department, correct? How mm -hmm. long have you been there? Uh, 19 years. Okay. Thank you for your service. Okay. That's great. Looking forward to your 20. Um, in your 19 years of experience with the city of Wichita, have there been other incidents where we've had an asking price and we've received, or an appraisal price, and we've received less than the appraisal price? There have. When the city of Wichita is looking at selling a property, we don't just look at the price. We're also looking at the cohesive use use of that user and how it works with the other properties in that corridor. In addition to that, we will put deed restrictions on our properties, which is not a traditional facet of a real estate transaction. So we are, in essence, continuing to control that land even after a sale. Thank you, Jerry. You're Appreciate welcome. Appreciate it. Council Member Glasscock. Thank you, Mayor. I have two quick questions. Uh, so when the city moved into our emergency shelter, so this RFP went out in September 2023? That's yes, when the applicants apply? September, October, yes. How much did the city spend in renovations to the current uh, building while we were um, preparing it to be the emergency shelter? I don't have that number readily available. I don't think we made any improvements. As far as... Yeah, as far as any kind of major in, in investment was made, none. Um, the city had put a substan substantial amount of money into that property in 2015 at, when we went to RFP at that time. Mayor, if I can, just clarification, most of the funding that we put into that building went into programming and paying for the expenses to operate the facility. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question, I noticed that, or... <coughs> Based on the applicants, it seems that all of them are nonprofits. That's correct. Did were, did we restrict it just to nonprofits for the application process to allow for profits to apply? No, we advertised this property to the entire real estate community. There has been some substantial interest from some nonprofits over the years in that, just because of that corridor. Oh, thank you. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. I see no further questions from council members, but I do, Jerry. Sorry. Oh, oh, I have sorry. several. Um, I'll start off with the RFP process so that everyone understands exact timeline. So in September of 2023, the RFP process began. How many days was that open to the public, uh, whether commercial or nonprofit? Uh, Josh, would you be able to answer that for me? Morning, Mayor, City Council, Josh Lauber. Um, the question is, is how many days on the street was it out? I don't have that on top of my head. I do know for two or three weeks it was out on the street and housing actually identified the property from purchasing's um, notification to City Council and the public that this property was available. So it had been out probably two or three weeks before 
any conversations of the emergency winter shelter. So maximum three weeks, is that correct? I'd say that's fair. I, I don't quote me, I don't have that on top of my head. I'd like to have the actual uh, information because yeah. um, again, this is a new council and three of us were not on this council when this uh, occurred. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know the exact timeline um, and the avenues in which it was shared to community of this opportunity. Um, as mentioned, it was on the street for not just nonprofits, but also anyone in the community who would want to purchase that property or lease that property. If I may clarify, the publication date was September 15th, 2023. And the end date? Um, the end date was due, due date of October 20th, 2023. Thank you. That's an RFP process question. Um, the next question then is the $682,000 um, specifically, how was that amount um, gathered by the applicant or from the real estate office? The $682,500 was the offer that was made by the applicant. We did not have a list price for the property. Thank you. Next question. Uh, yesterday I attended uh, District Advisory Board meeting uh, for District Number 2. And in that presentation, uh, we had an update regarding police substation East, uh, which will open up sometime this year with about nearly 20,000 square feet. This building is almost 20,000 square feet. My question then is um, really to staff, have we considered what other options we might need in the future regarding a building um, for city purposes? Um, and was that ever a consideration? Yes, when the city of Wichita looks at disposing property prior to its disposal and its, its request of council to do such, we do share that information internally with department heads to see if they have any immediate or future use for a property. And a police substation expansion or relocation was never considered? Not for that particular area. The, there is a relatively, one of our newer substations at, is out there on East 21st Street, just a couple of blocks away. And then one final question. Um, I think it was said that this was uh, advertised, I guess, to um, the community, specifically real estate agents were aware of this and in what avenue did that information get shared? I know that the realtors of South Central Kansas were just here yes, uh, just a few moments ago. Sure, we'll be happy to provide you the distribution list. We had the CCIM list and we had a brokerage list. Um, I was just looking at that on top of my head. It was maybe 100, more than 100. Um, of firms, and then we had another um, list on top of that. I just wanted to make clear, too, when this was originally solicited, it was September 15th with the original due date of October 20th. To Jerry's point, this was delayed. Um, so that date, I can get you a firm date, but it was extended. I don't want to misrepresent. Thank you very much. I see no further questions for staff at this moment. We will now open it up for public comment. wonderful council. Thank you guys so very much for all that you've done. And I know uh, my name is Teresa Lovelady and I represent uh, Health Court Clinic and Access to Healthcare on the 21st Street Corridor. Um, thank you so much for uh, allowing the property to go to great use. Um, when I think about what the property was just used for, for access for our emergency temporary homeless shelter, um, it, it was, it was, it was, it was compassionate, it was, it, it was meaningful, um, and yet uh, to be able to use this facility now for Habitat for Humanity to give people a real home, um, still extending what we 
do and how we work with our homeless individuals in our community, I think it's gonna be impactful and powerful. Uh, that Opportunity Drive Corridor is a special place on this part of the community. It's a place where our children grow, work and learn. My children grew, work and learned in that neighborhood. It's a place where our seniors, they have space that they can walk up the meridian and exercise and just different things there. Uh, there's food access there in that space. Our health center is right there. Um, we have the public library that just walks away. And of course, Wichita State is just with, uh, um, along that walking path as well. Um, I believe providing this opportunity for Habitat for Humanity is really going to help support and do something moving um, in our community. And not just there for the northeast side, but for all of Wichita. To have them have the space to expand their mission and scope and the ability to give people a real home. You know, that's like, the, we all want a real home. And in our community where we know our housing costs are going through the roof, we know that without affordable housing and proper housing, we're gonna extend some of our social, uh, our other social determinants of health and social disparities that really will not make our city that viable, incredible city that we know we are and we know that we can continue to be in the future. Um, please strongly consider allowing them to purchase this property um, for now and for evermore the great work that they're going to do around homelessness in our community and addressing that issue. Um, again, thank each of you. I know three of you were there when there was that. Um, I saw you guys, the new three members were there in the back when we were talking about um, having that homeless shelter, emergency temporary shelter being in that space. And I'm so proud of the three of you there. It was actually election day. Uh, when that happened, and so, so proud to see you guys there on there. And then thank you so much for those that have continued to serve our community in this way. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mayor and Council. My name is Levanta Williams, and I uh, at one point lived very close to the community that you're talking about. Habitat has been in existence since 1986, so you have an organization that is coming here that uh, is something that has proven itself to be very reliable. As a city council member, when I left, 13th and Oliver was going through some changes. At that point, we lost a Walmart and we gained uh, a furniture store. But as Walmart left, I called Walmart and said, please do not put anything in our community that is going to depress them. Do not put another liquor store, a nightclub, or a payday lending facility. When we also were looking at 13th and Oliver and Quick Trip was leaving, I did the same thing. He came into my office and I said, please don't oppress our community. No liquor stores, no payday lending, no nightclubs. Both of those upheld their obligation to our community. They both said, we will honor what you are saying. And so we did not get those there. The thing that I'm asking you today is to continue to help uplift our community. As a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha, that is one of my goals, to uplift our community. And I'm asking you right now to look at what you have, to look at where we've been, and I so appreciate you keeping your word and making sure that the building was vacated at a certain time. And so we're just asking you right now to keep your word about uplifting communities and putting place in place in communities, things that are going to bring them up, not depress them. That particular community has gone through so much so much, and they fight every single day. They fight so much that they're tired, that we are tired of fighting the EPA issues that are going on there because they feel that they have very little support, and so they continue to fight. They, they continue to fight for everything that they have. That is somebody's neighborhood. If you don't know what's going in there, that's what scares me. If you're ready to sell to someone else, that's what scares me. I can count on somebody who's been around since 1986. I can count on them to uplift the community by putting houses in place that need to be in place. 
I can remember Habitat coming to the rescue when we hopped a fence to feed a lady in the Rock the Block community. I can remember the community saying, the city forgot we even lived here. That's what that Rock the Block community told me. That's what the community is telling me that is in the contaminated issue on 21st going all the way up to maybe 37th Street. That the city is not paying attention to where they live. And so we've got to make sure that we're listening. We've got to make sure that we're helping. We've got to make sure that we're saying we are uplifting your community because that's everybody's neighborhood. That may be the neighborhood president down there, that may be her community, but this is your neighborhood. This is all of our neighborhood. And I'm just asking you today to look at what we have, look at offering that we have, look at the homes that have been built by Habitat, which is over 100, over 100 homes in one community. And I wish we could give you the statistics of how, how things went down, how crime went down. And I'm asking you right now to please Look at this with an open eye, making sure that you're making the best decisions possible and help uplift the Wichita community. Thank you. I'll stand for questions. None. Thank you. Mayor Wu, City Council members, my name is Lori Walker. I am the Program Director at Wichita Habitat for Humanity. I've been there since 2011. Um, and in the time I've been at Habitat, we've had two offices. Um, we're in our second one now. It's in the building that humankind owns. Um, we know that that's going to change in the not too distant future. We don't know exactly when. But a couple of years ago, when we started working on our strategic plan, we knew we had to do something about that. So in our strategic plan, we wanted to find a new location for our program offices and also find a location that would allow us to bring our construction and home repair teams into the fold to promote better communication and work practices amongst our teams. This building uniquely fits that bill and it's nearly perfect. At the same time, we were blessed by the McKenzie Scott Foundation with a very significant grant that puts us in the unique position to pay cash for this building and to also invest in this building to make sure that it serves our needs for the long term. I did want to point out, we did look up 2022. The value on that property, according to Sedgwick County, was $871,920. Mayor Wee, you had asked about that. That's the information you were looking for. In moving into this building, it can become a dynamic hub for Wichita Habitat for Humanity. We have expanded our educational programs. We offer the classes that we offer to our home buyers to anyone in the public for free. And able to, in order to be able to do that, we need more classroom space. This building will provide that. It will provide year-round climate-controlled volunteer activities in situations where we have rain and our volunteer crews can't be out on a build site, we can bring them to the warehouse, we'll have enough room to build walls within the perimeter of that building. Collaborative community programs with those on Opportunity Drive and in the 21st Street corridor. I just want to point out that in our response to the RFP, we had endorsements from Barry Downing with Top Learning Centers, from Janae Campbell with the Boys and Girls Club, Deanne Smith with Open Door, Christina Long with CML Collective, Rick Muma with Wichita State University, Teresa Lovelady with Health Corps, Marquita, Marquetta Atkins with Camp Destination Innovation, Brian Walker with the Kansas Food Bank, Ed O'Malley with the Kansas Health Foundation, Aaron Bastian with Fidelity Bank, Pete Najira with United Way of the Plains, and Ariel Rodriguez with Empower. This move is supported overwhelmingly by your community, people who care about what happens in Wichita, who care about affordable housing and are aware of the work that we're doing and want to support us in that work. And we're asking that you please do the same thing and make this a reality for Wichita Habitat. Any further public comments regarding this item? 
I see none. We will bring it back to the bench now. Mayor, Mayor. I'm sorry, down here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you had asked for a, a, the date of the extended dot deadline for submission of proposals. That was November 17, 2023. <coughs> Councilmember Member Ho-Heisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to just real briefly just say a couple things here. Um, this is a win-win across the board because not only are we able to give a building to a great organization who's making life-changing policies here, you know, that's generational wealth that's pa passed down when you own your own house. So over 100 houses, I know you guys are going to keep doing great work. I'm so glad that we're able to have somebody step into this space who's actually doing great work in the community and also across Wichita. So I applaud you guys for all the work that you're doing. And we're also able to put some more funding into the MAC. Um, so again, this is across the board, win-win for everybody. Um, it's unfortunate when you have some haters on the sideline who just like to kind of poke holes in every single good thing that people try to do. So. Um, again, thank you guys for doing great work. Keep doing the great work. And um, I just appreciate everything everybody's doing on behalf of housing people and our community. So that's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. Due to a personal conflict of interest, I'll be abstaining from this vote. Vice Mayor Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple more questions. Um, is is Habitat, will they be tax exempt, I assume, being a nonprofit? Okay. I think, um, obviously, I think Habitat does incredible um, work. You guys do awesome stuff with Rock the Block. I'm really excited to um, for you guys to move, should this pass. I think my main concern is um, to make sure that we aren't selling assets and never getting them back on the tax revenues to provide revenue. So that's my uh, my only um, main concern. Um, but I will be supportive. I mean, I will be supportive of this. I think it's, it's awesome. It's just something that we need to think about. Um, and the other question that I just wanted to ask is, was this property treated any differently than any other city asset that we sell? Okay, and my last question is, what are we doing to sell or lease any other unused city buildings to produce revenue? As those properties are identified, we do market them on our, at the city's website. We market them to the real estate community. We do keep a file on those properties and keep any interested parties who may have expressed interest over time so we can contact them when that property becomes available. We also send notifications to some of the adjacent property owners as well to try to help get the word out and to see if any adjacent property owners are interested in sur our surplus property. Do we ever put like a giant for sale sign um, from the city um, on properties? And obviously if you're in that wheelhouse, you know where to look, but maybe for people that don't know or aren't on those distribution lists, I mean, is that ever... That we, might be opening up a whole new can of worms. But. We, yes, we have done that. For instance, for the housing portfolio, we had signs made to put on those properties. Um, and I can recall a, another instance when we sold the car dealership at uh, Kellogg and Greenwich, we had a large banner made that the property was being advertised for sale in addition to other our other methods. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Johnston. I have a question. Is is it common? Go ahead. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Is it common practice to take, not take the highest bid for a property? We're always looking for the best opportunity and the and the and the most amount of money that we can bring in for the taxpayers. Yes. Um, so, but we're looking at um, other things though. We're looking at the compatibility and the ability to perform, um, in addition to a purchase price. Okay, obviously you don't have any confidence in McAdams. McAdams. The, it really with, um, their first preference was a lease with an option to purchase the property. 
Um, but the, uh, the contingency though, to tie up that additional four acres of land for a potential fut future development was, I know that was a sticking point for the committee. Thank you. I will say I absolutely love Habitat for Humanity. I, I try to volunteer there once a year. I probably get there once every other year. Uh, when I retire, I'd like to have it every week. I love it. I, I just have a problem with leaving $217,000 on the table. You don't say you're going to pay 900000 for it and, and not be able to do it. I understand. So, so I have a problem with that. So well, thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Glasscock. Yeah, just a few remarks. I want to echo uh, Vice Mayor Ballard's comments um, in terms of uh, for profits uh, or just a for profit to eventually get things back on the tax rolls. I love the idea of disposing of city property um, and making sure that we can reinvest it. So um, I'm thankful uh, for that as well. I do have concerns about what seems to be a three week process to be able to sell real estate. I know things move very slow, especially in corporate real estate. Um, and so that would be a concern for future processes. Just make sure to continue to open, Bob. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that was not a three week process. Okay. It was actually open on in September and closed in mid November. Oh, so yes, that that extension I just mentioned. What was the October twentieth date? I may have. Uh, that, that was the original. The original date, and, then it was and then extended. We extended. Okay, That's correct. thank you for that clarification. Yep. I appreciate that. Um, so those are really all my comments. Um, I think uh, this would be a great fit for the area. I also think. Central County and the state needs to reform their appraisal process because that's an insane increase um, for 2022. And I think uh, everybody feels that, not just uh, businesses, but also uh, private individuals as well. So from the bench, Central County and the state, please get your act together. Thank you. I see no further comments from the bench, but I have several comments regarding this. Um, first, uh, I need to be mindful of numbers, and I am grateful that those numbers were presented to us at the council meeting. Um, but I believe that out of full transparency, those numbers also should have been in the agenda packet um, so that community understands the process and how the valuation um, has increased over time. From 2023 to 2024, that increase according to the valuation, is $482,930. Um, and I'm mindful that that might not sell at that price. Again, it's just a valuation. Um, but that's a sizable uh, number of dollars that we, in a sense, would be kind of, in a way, donating to a nonprofit if, that, if it sold for $1.3 million. So... I guess I'm, I'm really concerned uh, when I hear from community uh, that they did not feel like they had an open process, even though we did uh, from the previous council, September 15th through November 17th was the request for proposal period. And as a city of Wichita, we do have a process uh, that is, again, the request for proposal process uh, that may look different than the private sector, but people should know that it was open and available to real estate agents, to community members, to nonprofits. So again, I want community to understand that that's why at every city council meeting, we have a board of bids before we even begin the new business. And that is an opportunity for community members, whether in the city of Wichita or outside of the city of Wichita, to bid for these um, jobs. And so I am mindful that the RFP process was open, despite may maybe some other folks not knowing about it, it was open and transparent since September to November when that period was open. Uh, when community brings up, again, the valuation, the new valuation from 2024 of nearly, again, $482,000 uh, of an increase, um, and the reason why it increased by that amount was because of a reclassification. Um, that again reminds me that there, everything could be an opportunity. So you might see it right now as a learning center, but it could, again, back in 1996, it was a life skill training center from a for-profit business that then decided to, again, 
no longer have that property in 2015. It became an educational um, facility, and now we have a nonprofit that does great work in our community. And I really appreciate that it's an evolution or it can be an opportunity. Um, but hearing from community uh, things like, will this now be back on the tax roll? It won't be back on the tax roll because it would be a nonprofit yet again. Um, and that is what Vice Mayor Ballard's concern uh, came about in sharing with community that we won't be getting extra revenue, property taxes on this. So we have to play a very important role in balancing when do we help a nonprofit that does great work in our community um, see this as an opportunity that is a win-win, like former, mayor, about former council member Levanta Williams said, find those opportunities where it really is trying to uplift our community. Um, I'm just at a, at a tug of war when it comes to this decision because as a free market individual that wants to make sure that everyone in our community has equal opportunity and access to that uh, chance, I, I just want to say a few words because I know that transparency is one of the things that um, as a council we uphold and want to make sure we are with our community. We started off today's meeting with a transparent statement that our agenda was not available in full um, in one area of our website, but it was shared on Thursday. So I want community to understand that we are, whenever there are issues or errors, we correct ourselves and we are open and transparent. And in this process, I don't see that we were not open or not transparent. I believe that we were open and transparent. And so because of the commentary from community, community-wide support, and a win-win situation, um, I do believe that this is in the best interest of community to move forward because we need the dollars also for a multi-agency center to address one of our greatest needs in our community, which is our challenge with homelessness. Um, so with that, um, I will move that we approve um, the recommendation from City Council uh, for the real estate agreement, authorizing the necessary signatures, and authorize staff to establish a cash-funded project for future use. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I see none, we'll open the roll. Motion passes with five to one and one abstention. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Approval of travel for Vice Mayor Ballard to attend the Summit on Homelessness and Housing in Lawrence, Kansas, April 23rd through 24th, 2024. With a motion to approve the travel for Vice Mayor Ballard to attend the Summit on Homelessness and Housing in Lawrence, Kansas, April 23rd through 24th, 2024. Second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? See none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Madam Clerk, uh, motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Approval of travel for Council Member Johnson to attend Create Campaigns Culture Com Compass in Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 27th through 28th, 2024. With a motion to approve the travel, Councilman Johnson to, to attend the Create Campaign's Culture Compass in Tulsa, Oklahoma, June 27th through 28th, 2024. Second. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. 
approval of travel for Council Member Johnson from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Washington, D.C. to attend Young Elected Officials National Convention or convening June 28th through 30th, 2024. Mayor, with a motion uh, for Councilman Johnson to attend uh, from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Washington, D.C. to attend the Young Elected Officials National Convening uh, June 28th through 30th, 2024, with a slight joke that this may be his last opportunity to. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? I see none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, please call the next item. Council Member Appointments and Comments. Council Member Glasscock. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to appoint Kelly Wins to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board. Vice Mayor Ballard. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to appoint Kim Newfield to Bike Ped Board. Council Member John Stun. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to appoint uh, Mike Hill to the Ethics Board, pending his uh, background check, which I don't think would be a problem. I hope not anyway. And also uh, appoint Tor Wynn to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Board and reappoint Kent Gose to the Board of Park Commissioners, Brian Fry to the MAPC and MZA, and Elaine Steffen to the Animal Control Board. Is there a motion to approve the slate of appointments? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? I see none. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. Motion passes 7-0. Madam Clerk, actually, any comments now from council members? Council Member Ho Heisel. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just real quick, a point of clarification. When I was referring earlier to haters, I was not referring to anybody on this bench. Um, we have to ask appropriate questions. We have to do our due diligence. So I just wanted to point that out. It's more people who see conspiracy behind every rock and slander people without any sort of basis of fact. Now, saying that, I am going to put on my haters hat real quick. Um, JV, congratulations on winning the pool, the NCAA bracket. You chose the number one overall ranking. Good job. That's, that's real tough. Um, also, <laughs> District 6... Um, uh, Riverside Park is going up against um, our very own Watson Park in the finals of uh, nice. Parkness. All I'm going to say is the only thing memorable about Riverside Park may be the zoo, which um, and the rocket Excuse ship me? that you can't even get up into anymore, but you can take the train all day long at O.J. Watson Park. We got the yellow brick road. We got putt-putt. Please, anybody out there listening, anybody out here. We know the best park in the city. So uh, go. We got about another hour. Uh, let's just make sure that the, the truth is known out here. So thank you for that. Council Member Johnston. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to thank your uh, somewhat marginal congratulations on the pool. <laughs> and we make note there's no money involved in the pool. So just, just a sense of pride. And a sense of pride that who watches the most basketball and is most knowledgeable about basketball obviously got first in this case. So, like I say, the cream always raise, rises to the top. And, again, this is the case. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you again. And congratulations uh, to Council Member Johnston for winning our bracket, uh, office bracket uh, competition. I do have a couple of comments. I just want to say again, congratulations to the mission, um, the Century Mission crew, who safely got back to Wichita after traveling around the world in uh, just a matter of a couple of days. Uh, I was able to uh, represent the city council on Saturday evening in welcoming them back to Wichita uh, because this was, again, a fundraiser for the classic Learjet Foundation that is trying to restore the very first uh, Lear that was delivered to a customer. Um, and so it was a point of pride to be able to represent uh, the air capital of the world there and also celebrate uh, the Kansas Aviation Museum's fundraiser event. Um, again, another uh, wonderful organization in our community. And just a reminder that we have lots of wonderful nonprofits in our community. 
just um, talked about Habitat for Humanity and many others. And so I just want to remind community that there's always an opportunity for you to uh, volunteer, help out, and uh, please participate uh, this upcoming Sunday for a free event at um, Open Streets ICT, which is right in front of WSU. 17th Street will be closed on Sunday from noon to 4 o'clock. So encouraging community to come together, enjoy the outdoors, and really be part of the Wichita community. So thank you again uh, for the comments section. And I will ask if we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Madam Clerk, please open the roll. With. <laughs> Motion passes 6-1. Council Member Johnson can continue being up here. All right. I now state my authority as the new mayor. <laughs>